All right. We are live. Hello, welcome to investors. Let's just get on into it. So um, part of the reason why, you know, I always have to say y'all just met me today, most of y'all. Some of y'all have been here before. Some of you have seen me before. So you kind of know my history, but visually let me just show it to you. So and why I know about pitching to investors. So for about seven years, these are the kind of things. We used to do investor pitches where entrepreneurs would get up and pitch to an audience of a network of business angels and investors. And so all kinds, this is a, an example of Atlanta Technology Angels. And then you had more of my NBA and I. We have all kinds, you see all the types. So you know, that's what, this is what you considered a angel group size presentation. Okay, so about 40 or 50 people will be there. Then you get into smaller settings where it's a boardroom environment. And so this is sort of a, what we might call a small group where you might get 10 or 15 people there, good, good, sometimes it's five. And then if you're eventually at some point, if you're raising a lot of money, you're gonna do a large group, like an Adventure Atlanta kind of a, of a format. So ours was called the Southeast Private Equity Conference. Around that for a few years prior to Venture Atlanta, they used this as the blueprint for what they do now. So they have the big pitch like this. And then we did this sort of reverse capital event where, because once you, one of the part of, of pitching is, is, and you'll learn today, is what happens after the pitch. And so in a big setting, you want to be able to have the investors come to you to ask you the questions that they need to ask you. And so, you know, this is an example of all, you know, people talking to, um, investors talking to the entrepreneurs and going up to the ones they were interested in at the Southeast Private Equity Conference. And then afterwards, it's all about the networking and going up and, and you know, being able to answer their questions in, in the time frame that they are expect to get an answer because they're trying to, you know, unless they're just chit-chatting, they're trying to get information to decide about the next meeting that they're going to go to, if they're going to go to another meeting. And so, you know, it's a, ma a matter of mixing and mingling and all those kind of things. So you can kind of get an idea of the kinds of, of events we did. This is one of the investors that prepared. She got money from this guy and then another guy that was at the event. This one, this is a VC or used to be a VC, Kathy, who brought this person to pitch a lot of that. So, all right. So my title say it all, so a little bit more about me. So I'm an economist and I turned microeconomist, meaning that I was educated in, at Emory and University of Florida as an economist, but when I decided to become the person that I am today as this advisor to entrepreneurs and investor, I was a microeconomist. This was told to me at a pool party with an alumni, and they said, oh, you're a microeconomist. I was like, okay, really? I guess I am, because it's all about what is happening at, with that entrepreneur that's creating the supply that meets the demand that has an impact on the economy, so microeconomist. And so my company is Cooper Rand Capital Holdings. Again, I'm Karen Rands. And when I was at IBM, one of my nicknames was the deal maker. So I used to, my last job there was, was the complex opportunity business manager. And my job was to bring together the resources that entrepreneurs, startups, and growing companies needed from within IBM, but then also so they could go out and get capital and come back and spend it with IBM. And so I was the deal maker. And I left IBM because I had this client that I was going to go get raised capital for. And that, for a lot of different reasons, that didn't actually work out. Timing was part of it. Um, and, you know, issues that I'm not going to get into today, but it's, it's one of the fundamentals of investors and entrepreneurs. And so, Launch FN was the company that I, I joined up with these other guys to bring needed services to the uh, entrepreneur community so that they could go and raise capital. They would be prepared for raising capital, be most likely to raise capital because they had all the pieces and parts in there and they knew how to communicate their message. And so that was Launch FN. It was rolled up under Cougar and Capital Holdings. And I'm an opportunist, okay? So I had an opportunity because when I first left IBM, I was invited to a Network of Business Angels and Investors meeting. And the guy that founded that had decided that he was looking for somebody to take over and mentor so he could retire. And so about three or four years into Launch FN, he came to me and he said, um, you know, would you like to take it over? We worked out a deal. And so I became the managing director for the Network of Business Angels and Investors, mirrored it up with Launch FN, and that's where you saw all those events and things that I showed you. So I called myself a venture catalyst because of that whole speeding up the process of a company getting to market and growing by bringing them the resources and, and, and capital that they need, but then that ultimately became the compassionate capitalist, that concept. And so I'm sort of the, I'm the, the um, 
the, the visionary behind the, what I call the compassionate capitalist movement. And so when the economy started to tank in 2010, um, I realized that my radio show had been called the Spec Talk Radio Show because of the big event that we did. And I realized there was a lot of money sitting on the sidelines and I needed to try to encourage these people that had the money, these investors, to you know, realize the best way to impact the economy is to invest in small businesses that are gonna create the jobs, bring the innovation to the market, you know, create a catalyst within the economy. And the compassionate capitalist is a way to do that because I defined it as people that invest time, knowledge, resources, money into entrepreneur endeavors to bring innovation to the market, create jobs, and create wealth for all of those involved. And so that was the compassionate capitalist. So, a decade ago, I changed my radio show to the Compassionate Capitalist Radio Show. I've been pro-promoting that. It's been on my my book, book. I mean, been on my um, on my card, all that kind of stuff. I had written this book back when I was rebuilding in the NBA and I, and, take, and I took it over to provide education to investors. And I, after the the recession, I sunsetted it because I had a different vision for what was going on. That that type of event wasn't really an efficient business model for companies raising capital, and then the Jobs Act happened in 2012. And if you're not familiar with the Jobs Act, the Jobs Act is, was the congressional mandate to remove the barrier between entrepreneurs and investors by allowing invest entrepreneurs to be able to generally solicit under certain rules to, uh, to investors. They basically, if they, if they file the right paperwork, they do the right things, they can advertise to anybody and everybody that they are raising capital, which is not allowed if they don't do that, okay? So so that was where the National Network of Angel Investors became, I'm gonna create this virtual organization of, of investors that are too busy to be a part of an angel group because they're running their own company or geographically restricted. And they, because of this Jobs Act and crowdfunding and all this crowd finance and general solicitation, 506C, Reg A+, plus, all that stuff, they need to figure out how to invest in those companies. And they don't know how to do that because nobody's teaching them. So I wrote, rewrote the book called An Inside Secrets to Angel Investing. It became a bestseller and uh, uh, twice, you know. So I uh, continued to market that, working on a series underneath it. The next one's going to be Inside Secrets to Raising Capital, and this is one of the components of it. So one of the things, what we do is we provide skills, strategy, preparation, access to capital, investor relations, and growth hack to entrepreneurs. So here's the baseline, okay? Um, I didn't get my numbers, in, in, my, my, link, my, my lead is proper, so you got my punchline already. But anyway, for the formula for raising capital is very easy. It's really quite simple. A plus B plus C equals dollar signs. Okay, so it's really a simple formula. But it actually means that A is the investor that is, um, you already know the investor, you already have a relationship with this investor and they trust you. They believe in you and they trust you. Okay, B is that they've got money ready to invest. They're just waiting for an opportunity to come along to invest and C is that you represent the exact kind of investment that they want to invest in. And so if you've got A plus B plus C, then you get the money. And if you don't have A plus B plus C, which is pretty much 100% of the time, because you don't ever hear about anybody raising capital that had this, right? They already knew the people, so they're not out pitching. You know, they already knew who they're gonna get the money from. You know, they already, they already, they don't have to do any of this stuff because they knew an investor that had all the money they needed that was exactly matched to the kind of business that they were doing. And 99% of the time, that's not the case. And so if, if, if any of those is not at 100%, you must do more, okay? And that means you must talk to more investors. You must, um, you may not understand, they, uh, some of the times the timing is that they may not have the money right now to invest, so that's another thing of more investors because it's the timing of when they actually have the money to invest because they may have desire and they may have money, but they may not have money right this minute, okay? Because one of the things about investors, none of them have a coffee can in their cabinet with a bunch of money in it waiting to put into a company. It's all invested someplace else, right? So part of you, the desired investment is that you, the message, the story that you do in a pitch is convincing them that your opportunity is better than anything else that they're looking at and better than anything else they're already invested in. That's a high bar, but that's, you gotta make that bar, okay? And that you're not any riskier, or the reward at least is better than whatever risk you 
you represent in your type of deal. So that's a key piece of that. All right. So the next thing, P key component, fill the funnel. I wasn't going to cover this, and I said, how can I talk about pitching if, and why you do all these pitches? Because I was, so, you know, I sunset for a period of time when I sunset the angel group and I did some other things. I did some private consulting while I was work, reworking on the book and things like that. And so I'm getting back in the game of doing this. We did this back when I did all those events. I did this pitch on a regular basis. And so, you know, filling the funnel was something I talked about, but I realized that because I got back in the game, most people have no idea that they have to have a funnel. Every entrepreneur understands a sales funnel. You know, uh, the folks that you, you have presented today, you understand how many eyeballs you got to get in, how many people you got to get to download your app to become the ones that are actually going to be the ones that will monetize it for, you know, all that stuff. There's a sales funnel. Any entrepreneur understands sales funnel. Well, there's a capital funnel too. And this is based off of over 15 years of working with entrepreneurs, raising capital, asking the ones that have raised capital, how many investors did you talk to? Asking investors how many deals that they looked at. Asking whether it didn't raise capital, how many investors you talked to. All right, it didn't raise all the capital. So the formula is the Cougar, I call it the Cougar N Theory of Private Equity. It's my, because my company is Cougar N Holdings. I named it that, kind of like on Moore's Law, although I didn't think that Rand's Theory of Private Equity would carry much weight, you know, until like way down the road and I'm dead and people are building upon that theory. But right now, Cougar N Theory sounded like, okay, that must be something. What does that mean? So anyway, I named it Cougar N Theory of Private Equity. So the formula is one times three times 15. So for every person that you get to write is stroke a check, you're gonna have what we call three sweethearts. These are the people that you're gonna spend time with, answering their questions. And this is really geared towards that initial capital raise that this formula works, that, that series A type of a formula, okay? But to get to three sweethearts, 15 have to have seen it. So it's a five X, okay? So it's it's actually five, so it's, it's for every one, there's three times five, it's 15, okay? So what that means, if you're raising a million dollars and the average investment that an, that an investor makes is $25,000, that's the national average, okay? So that means you gotta have 40 check writers and you have to meet, that means you're gonna spend time with 120 sweethearts that you're gonna be answering their questions and you know spend the time with them and going back and forth on due diligence so if you do a 5X on that, that means 600 have to have seen it or thought about it. So the problem with a lot of entrepreneurs when they enter into the capital raising process is that they, they'll go to an event, there's 40 people there, they think they're all investors, but remember the formula? Not all of them are the ones that they have, they already know, they don't know them, so then that, that A is out of the picture, they have to do something else to stop, that's the time, that's the sweetheart piece comes in. They may or may not like their deal. And, you know, so out of that five, out of that 40 people, you're actually hoping that you get, if you get three that want to follow up with you, you did good. You get five even better, right? Because you're entering your nods. A lot of times entrepreneurs will pay a bunch of money to go to an event like Gathering of Angels. And there'll be 25 people there and they'll get one. And then they'll be all mad at the organization because they didn't get more investors. They didn't get all 25 people to invest. And the reality is that you know, if you win, and, and they blame the organization. You know, in you know that not to not to be an endorsement or non endorsement for Gathering of Angels, but any organization that you pitch, even Atlanta Technology Angels, any organization that you go to pitch, or any place wherever you are in, in the U.S., you're pitching investors. There's an audience there, and there's some number of them that are going to be interested. And if you don't get a basic number, then you have to reflect on what it is that you're communicating because you did not communicate properly to them to get their interest. If you were, I always use this example, if you were a healthcare software company and you knew that hospitals exactly needed your application, it would save them tens of thousands of dollars every year, and you had an opportunity to pitch to a room full of hospital administrators and hospital CEOs, the exact person that can make a business decision about your pet, and everybody at the end of it, nobody was interested in your deal, would you say, there is nobody there from a hospital. I can't believe that I pitched all these people in the hospital and they, you know, no, you would go, because in, in sales as an entrepreneur, you say, what did I do wrong? What did I miscommunicate that they didn't understand my value proposition? And that's the same thing with investors. You are selling your business, your opportunity to the investors. So you have to figure out how to maximize 
that potential. So, what you're gonna learn today, the difference between the different pitches, the fundamentals of a pitch, the goals, what you don't think are actually in a pitch, and how to get to the goal, okay? That's what you're gonna learn. What you're not gonna learn today is how to do an elevated pitch. That's a key component of the process of raising capital. How you're gonna network for money, also a key process. How does crowdfunding pitching vary from this and the formula of the capital funnel? What is the capitalization strategy and structure? What, what, how much should you raise? What kind of capital should you raise? How should you raise it? All that stuff. Those are all things that I have talked about previously in other pitches. You can go to Facebook, The Karen Rands, or Business Investor Grow, or go to my blog and there's articles on that stuff. But those are all pitches that I have done in the past. You can go watch them um, just like this. Okay, so a big part of a pitch is the individual pitch versus the group pitch. So the individual pitch is when you get that appointment with that key person um, that was referred to you or you met someplace and you decide that they, are, they might be an investor or they could be an investor and so you're going to do that. Group pitch is when you're in, in investing to your, like that audience that I talked about, right? So an individual might be a small group or, you know, a small group setting, two or three people at a conference table, you know, like there's a... Um, I ran into one of my investors I ran into a while ago. He basically out there at where he lives in the country club in the south. They have five guys that get together and talk about deals, and that would be like a small group, right? So generally, they're generally knowledge about your deal because you got introduced to them either face to face or by a, a warm referral, or somebody is there with you in the meeting that put that meeting together. So they kind of already know it's going to be much more interactive. You're going to probably have 20 minutes to an hour to talk to them. You're going to do a, a key pitch, and then you're going to answer their questions over lunch or something like that for the next time. And you, they're emphasizing the relationship, the trustingness of it, because when investors make a decision and buy a decision, there's a subjective element and an objective element. The objective element is all of the quantitative and qualitative pieces of it that they look on their checklist of what they can make money. The subjective side of it is, do I like this entrepreneur? Do I believe that they have the passion that they need to succeed? Do I trust them, right? So you, so a lot of this is relationship building when you're doing a, on a small group and when you do that follow-up with the sweethearts. So an angel group or a venture event setting, you're, the audience, you don't really know who the audience is. It, whoever's coordinating it, you should ask them. Who in your audience invests in software apps? Who in your audience invests in, in consumer toys or hair products or you know, whatever it is, or, you know, IT stuff, or, you know, a healthcare app, or whatever it is. You want to find out who in the audience it might be, so they can point them out. So during the presentation, if you know that you're going, you can do some eye contact with them, or something like that. So you're starting to really, you can see if they're getting, the one that you know is in, invest in your kind of company, then you might be able to get, trigger them. They're who you really are looking at, right? And a lot of times you have to understand that in this kind of a presentation, it'll be the first time that they've heard of your deal. They might have gotten a one pager prior to, but a lot of these things they walk in and they got no idea. Now it used to be when people were on their phones, it was because they were bored. Now people actually do take notes on their phones, so it's not necessarily, you have to see if they're looking up and stuff like that, but it, a, a key indicator is if you're, and there's, when I teach about pitching, I talk about key words you put in it that brings them back into the presentation. So. Okay, if you, you're doing a short presentation in those settings, usually six to nine minutes, and you might have, um, and, and you're introducing it, and the whole goal, I'm gonna come back to this later, because this is one of those misnomers of what an entrepreneur is, and this is this client that I have right now, I've been, I've been battling with them on not putting too much information in there. Because unless you're using a pitch where it's a, like a story deck, and they're just gonna be reading it, if you're standing up and doing the presentation, your goal is to get to the next meeting. The only thing you want is for them to want to talk to you. That is your number one goal. They will never, I heard stories in the dot-com days of people writing checks at events, but I've never ever seen it at any event I've ever been to in my 20 years of doing this stuff. It's all about getting to the next meeting, okay? So they can start asking the questions. I had a, when I first took over the group, I always wanted to do a nine minute, 10 minute, 12 minute presentation. And I was at this venture conference and a couple of the VCs I was talking to there that I knew were really experienced. And they were talking about, because this particular event was a six minute presentation. I was like, how can you do a six minute presentation? And one of the guys, um, he used to run ATPC, Steve Fleming, uh, and uh, he told me, 
that um, he was a venture capitalist and he was then he ran into DC and he said, if they don't tell me in the first 90 seconds why I should pay attention for the next five minutes, then I'm ne I, they're already a no. So he says, if they can't tell me in six minutes why I want to spend another 60 minutes with them in follow-up, then they're already a no. So you have to be able to get your story down succinctly within that six minute time frame. And ideally if it's six minutes, you might have two, three minutes for Q&A afterwards. And so there's part of it when you have additional information, you use it for backup charts for answering questions that you anticipate they might have. So we talked about the funnel. So the purpose of the group pitch is to fill the funnel faster. How do you get to 600 investors when you're raising a million dollars and are gonna look at your deal, right? If you're not doing general solicitation, I'm just going to move this just a little because okay, you're not in the frame. Yeah, I was okay. so there you, you go. got to fill your you got to fill your funnel faster. So if you can get to an audience where there's a hundred people, that's a hundred people that have heard your pitch. Now, granted, maybe only thirty percent of them might be actual investors, but there's still people that can do what we believe is or I believe is a real key part of it, and that's creating a buzz, right? So if you fill your funnel faster, faster, you can shorten the capital raise process because you've got to increase access to capital. There's more potential there of those people that have the B part. And the a, you know what I mean? They're the ones that have the money to spend. And then it's just a matter of funneling them through to find out if you're the C part, the person that is the kind of deal that they want to invest in. And it's going to, say, they're going to, it's going to save you time. Because sometimes when you spend all that time on a small group and you're meeting with two or three people, well, if you spent an hour pitching to three people, and they may or may not have been qualified because there are people in town, and I'm sure it's in every town, that they take people's money to set up these lunches, and the lunches are like just guys coming to get a $50 steak dinner and a glass of wine with no intention of investing in anything that they see. They're just there to justify their buddy that charged $2,000 to set that meeting up to, you know, so he could charge $2,000 and they get a fancy meal out of it, okay? So that happens all the time. So buy or beware of that, right? But you save time because they'll qualify themselves in a group setting. They're going to come up and ask for information. Now you know they're interested. They have just turned into a sweetheart, right? So if you have an opportunity to present that, that's the whole idea why crowdfunding in theory works. You have a larger audience. It's just a whole different funnel mechanism. So if you have an opportunity to then call those people, you are filling your funnel faster, right? Okay, so, and this part about creating the buzz. So a big part, whenever I talk to people about, well, how did you raise your two, three million dollars and how many people did you talk to in this formula? They all often always say the formula is even conservative to what it actually took. But a big part of it is creating the buzz so they can walk away from the meeting and all those people that may not be investors in that meeting can walk away from the meeting and the next week when they're playing golf or they're at their kids' soccer game, standing on the sidelines and they're talking to somebody and, they, and most people don't have this normal friend conversation. Oh, how much money do you have? Do you invest in, in entrepreneurs? They don't really have that conversation. But there are key things that happen where they say, you know, they'll be talking and they'll say, oh, have you, you know, I was looking at a company the other day, a public company, so this is person, person A saw your pitch. Person B says, you know, I've been looking at getting into some of these ICOs or I've been, you know, looking at my portfolio on my stock market and, you know, I've been really trying to find something that's in the, let's just say, cannabis industry, okay? I've been looking for something in the cannabis industry because it seems like it's a really hot growing sector and stuff like that. You know, and then this person says, oh, you know what? I was just at this pitch event last week, and there's this company that has a, I'll just say it, verification app for people that, and to make sure they actually have a medical license before they walk into this, the place to, to, you know, get their, their medicinal cannabis, right? And they, they, and they know how to articulate that and remember it. You're memorable enough and they can articulate the basic value proposition so that person will go, really? Do you know much more about it? He goes, no, but I think I have a flyer on them. I'll email it to you. I'll get their contact information. I'll text it to you. I'll take a picture of the flyer and send it to you. Whatever. So you have just taken a person that was not interested. They were kind of interested. They're curious, right? But they weren't a, a sweetheart and potentially created a sweetheart because they could walk away and talk about what it was that you did. Okay? That's creating the buzz. 
because every invest investor, particularly on the investor side, has potential to invest or know somebody. So they're, sometimes it may not be their industry. They're kind of like, yeah, cannabis is kind of good, but I don't know, you know what I mean? What, the legal stuff? And I've never smoked, I never inhaled, you know, whatever. And so the other person, they go, well, maybe if Joe, he's looking into it, if he wants to invest, then maybe I'll invest too. Okay, so you might get two sweethearts that convert into investors because you're able to create the buzz. All right, and a big process of group things is learning and improving, right? Every time you pitch, you're gonna get feedback. Hopefully they'll give you feedback on forms and you're gonna learn and improve and get better because part of the fill of the funnel and that conversion factor is that the first money is the hardest money. But guess what? By the time you've got that first money in, you've gotten pretty good at this, at handling questions, at figuring things out, and you know, responding and talking to investors so the rest of the money gets easier. It really does. And so learning and improving becomes part of that process. Okay, so common pitch mistakes. Using a sales presentation. All the time we see companies do this. You're not selling a customer. It's not just about feature function benefit. It's about what the investor cares about, okay? They're trying to sell the decision. And then what the investor cares about is only going to make money back. That's what they care about. And, and answering that piece of it. So selling the, the decision. They're trying to get them to make a decision right now on, on this, and they try to answer all the questions, and sometimes, because they put so much information into it, they don't get to the stuff that the investor really cares about. Because they run out of time, and they're six minutes, and they're cut off, and they go, what? You know, because they tried to cram so much in there, and I naturally talk fast, so I have to take a deep breath sometimes and slow down, but talking fast, because you're trying to cram so much information in there, you know, that's the thing. So selling the decision, you want to sell the follow-up. So like an example of that would be, what's your marketing strategy? So my customer acquisition strategy is, um, we, we, we have a full 15 page white paper that we've done on the market research on it, but here's the highlights. Da, 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 da. And you know, happy to share that with you afterwards if you'd like that information or more information on that. So you're selling the follow-up meeting because they know that you've got, you're only giving them an appetizer of how much you actually know about your business model. Not being prepared. It would be amazing when people would pay fees to go to do stuff and they would get up there and they, would have, they wouldn't know their charts. Now you, know, you can look at a thing and it tells you what's coming, but they would stand here and read their charts. I've seen people do that all the time. They stand and read their charts because they are all new. Somebody else did it for them. They might have looked at it once on the plane. They haven't really even practiced it, you know? And so, you know, you gotta be prepared. Get coached and practice. Film yourself. Before you do your first big meeting, get the understanding, get feedback. You know, this thing, One Million Cups, is an excellent opportunity to practice getting up in front of people. And some people are just also have a fear of presenting. And you have to get, and the best way to get over your fear is practice. Okay? All right. Trying to cram too much. I talked about that. You can hit the highlights of it. And it's a large font with limited bullet points, right? You do not want to have paragraphs on your screen. Because what happens if you have paragraphs, what are they doing? They're reading your chart. They're not listening to you. People are really hard for people to listen and read at the same time, okay? So if they're reading your chart, you want to be able to have, tell your story and, and all of what's all behind you is highlighting what and reinforcing what your words are. So, and not understanding what is important. What is important? I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to put it up here. I, got, I actually have an audience. What, what do you think is the most important thing to an investor sitting in the audience? How am I getting my money back? Exactly. How am I going to make my money back? Return on investment. That's exactly right. Good answer. So the elements of your story. You've got to have your unique value proposition. Why is, you know, there's rare that there is, and I, I would venture to say even before Uber, there is probably somebody in Texas, let's say, trying to do some kind of a, of a, a business model like that. So there's, you know, there's people that, and if, you know, your unique value proposition is why, what, if, why does your customer target market really want, who is your target market, why do they really want what you're doing, your authentic customer, and then why you, why are you the one doing this? It's not just about the money, so part of it is your own, personal credibility you need to establish in the presentation because remember a they don't know you so how do they they're not going to give you a stranger their money they have to they, they want a little bit of why you're the one 
right? And so something in your background, something in your team, something that says you have the ability to succeed in this just because of your experience, knowledge, or something like that. And it's not just about the money, because if it's just about the money, there, somebody down the street could do the same thing, right? And so how are you going to execute on your business strategy, right? So that comes into sort of the go-to-market or some of these other elements. What are you clear on your next steps, your milestones, what you're going to do with the funds, you know, what you, so you know how you're going to build your business. The conversation I was having yesterday with my client in, in reinforcing to him, investors, because I have entrepreneurs come to me all the time, I got a patent, I need money. Well, investors don't invest in patents. They might buy a patent and then go start a company with it, but they, that's what comes out of colleges, right, when they license the technology, but they invest in companies, in businesses. And that means that there's a strategy around what the patent is going to enable you to create a product that's going to go to market, that's going to generate revenue, that's going to produce a return on the investment, which means that there's an exit at some point in time. And so what's the use of funds? One of the big mistakes that people have when they talk about the use of funds is that they'll have these you know, specific things and they'll have like this thing that's like 40% of their money is just, you know, other, I don't know. It's just like this and it's like working capital and that's their hedge because they don't want to ask for too less. They don't really know what it says to an investor that you don't really know what you're going to do with the money. So you're just going to throw a lot of money on the walls and hope that it works. And so you need to have an understanding of what it is. And in the presentation, you're not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but you say, here's the five key areas of what we're going to use the funds on. We have a very detailed plan of how we're going to implement the funds as they come in based on key milestones, and I'm happy to share that with you after the presentation. I'm at booth 40, okay? That kind of thing. Always driving for them to come and ask you questions on the follow-up. And here's your competition. One of the biggest things, the mistakes that entrepreneurs will make is they say there is no competition. Well, there is always competition, okay? Because at the very least, if you're doing something brand spanking new, then it's the status quo. You have to educate people on why they would want to do this as a better way of doing whatever they've been doing it before. And so there's always competition. And so you have to understand in your, in your target customer's mind, how do they do it? What do they think? And is there a value for them to change their behavior to use whatever it is that you're offering them? And then they exit. So most exits are acquisitions. So I always recommend, people will say, oh, we're gonna be, you know, to go public is huge. And in the world of um, unicorns, <laughs> the bar has been set very high. And so, but there's a lot of opportunities with the new programs like Reg A Plus, you can have a backdoor into the capital markets and provides liquidity. But you also, it's really on an exit, it's on acquisition. But guess what? Most of the companies that do acquisitions are public companies. You can go get their K9s and look at their 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 report up on the at the SEC, and they'll show exactly who all they bought in the last year. And you can look at those companies. You know, you know who your competition is, or somebody that was kind of like your competition. Look for press releases and see if they've been bought, right? you know, and say, you know, so this is the kind of company we have to become to be able to get this type of value at an acquisition price, and these are the companies that buy my kind of company. You know, you don't know the exact stuff, but you have to have a general idea that you're building, you've got a roadmap, right? If your destination is to produce a return on investment and create wealth for yourself and your investors, then you have to start at A and know where you're going. You have to have a map, a roadmap. And there may be turn, twists and turns on that road, but you know if you're going to Albuquerque, you know that you're going to, there's a couple different ways you might get there, but you're still going to get to Albuquerque at some point in time, okay? All right. Oh, please. Hey, I'm emphasizing all my points. <laughs> well, I like to leave that. Okay, so the anatomy of a 10-minute pitch. So this is based off, it's kind of old, but... It's still valid. Anatomy of a Pitch was Alliance of Angels had put this together back a while ago, and um, I, I swiped it um, and used it as a baseline and give them credit. So I'm going to step over on this side. So, I'm block it. Um, so if you see here, you can see, right, you're starting with an introduction. That's your elevator pitch. That's your 
you know, that first 90 seconds that I talked about, right? Everybody knows where an elevator pitch, that's the time it takes for you to go up to the executive floor and you hopefully you've met the executive that's gonna invest in your business in that time and they wanna get off the elevator with you and talk, right? And so you do this as a basic introduction of what that is and that usually includes the problem that you, in the marketplace, the solution and how you're solving that, right? If you have traction in some way, number of users or something, or you're at this, you've got an MVP on your thing, you, you build that into this first part of the first section. That happens in the first two and a half minutes. It's on a 10 minute pitch. And you talk about your market size. Here's how many people, here's my target customer, here's how many people are using that. Now, if you're doing something where there's like a big player in the marketplace already, well then you say, these are how many people use that app. Here's how many people use this app. Here's how many people that use this app. And so I am, you know, and so that within that, we know that the scope, I'm not just saying I'm going to go after all of America. I'm saying I'm going to go after these people that are already using this app, you know, these kind of apps, because some segment of them have the pain point that I'm trying to solve, right? The problem, the solution. And so who's your target customer. And then what's your business model? How are you going to go out and sell it? What's your sales cycle? How are you going to market it? How are you going to you know, attract those customers and convert them into you know, people that use your app or pay you money or whatever is buy your product? What are any of the barriers to entry to your competition? Right? So you got your IP protection is number one, but also it's sort of joint venture agreements, you know, things that you might have partners, people that are on your team. So you're into this in six and a half minutes now. Then you're into competition, partners, joint ventures, your management team. If you don't have a full management team, then who's on your advisory board that fills the gaps of what you're lacking in your management team, right? So if you, if you sat down and you said, you know, and in one place, if you're not really sure, you can go to the small business development centers, they're, out, they're at just about every camp, college campus. There's a lot of mentoring programs and um, incubator programs you can get involved in. Um, here in Atlanta, we have Flashpoint. They just did a new a new applicate a new period. They're taking applications, you know. So those kind of things will help you with this stuff, and you'll get people on your advisory board that fill those gaps. Sometimes it's somebody that you might want to hire that's got a day job, and they can't do their day job till you've got the money. So you put them on it as an advisory board. They help you raise your money so that they can have a job with you. Okay, and they're on your advisory board, giving you that advice as you're going through this process of raising capital and talking to the investors and looking for investors also, right? But that's kind of part of that. And then you get into your financials, what's your, what your forecast going to be, when you're going to start making money, your use of funds, and then the offer, right? So in a small, in a setting of an angel group, you can talk about exactly how much money you're going to raise, all that stuff. If you filed for one of the general solicitations, you can talk about exactly how much money you're going to raise and what you're gonna do with it. If you're in the recommendation, if you've not done any of the things in a big environment like Adventure Atlanta or one of these big tech conferences, South by, Southwest by, Southeast by Southwest, any of these things where they have these big pitch events, um, don't do that unless you're actually registered because technically you're breaking the law with the SEC, a general solicitation and you're not a public company, you're not, you've not filed proper paperwork to be able to general solicit. And now that we have a whole regulation on it, they actually pay attention to that stuff. So what you do is you say, you say, you know, you, you talk about what you're going to do with the money. These are the things that we're going to do with the money when we receive the money. Because of SEC rules, I can't talk to you specifically about the terms of our offer, but if you'll come and find me afterwards at booth 40, you can talk to me about what you mean. Because all, all the SEC requires if you're not doing digital solicitation is that you've got a prior relationship with that investor. So in an angel group, you the, the angel group becomes a prior relationship. If you are in, um, if not, if you're in a big group and you have no idea because some of them are investors, some of them aren't, then you don't have any relationship with them. They're just people that are there. So you have to get them to come to you and you tell them those things. All right. So when you go into a six minute pitch, you got to break this down into key areas and you, that's where you get much more into telling a story. 10 minute pitch, you're going to have charts, just about almost every one of these things you're going to have a chart on, right? And so that's a kind of your framework of that. When you get into a six minute, you have to skish all this stuff together and tell a story that is coherent. So the way you do that is your elevator, in your elevator pitch, you talk about the need and your response. When I, when I teach people how to do elevator pitches, there's a, there's a, 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 a need, the response and your sort of your USV, your unique thing that helps you solve it, you know, your outcome, right? 
and then you're gonna talk about your market opportunity and your competition, and then you're gonna talk about execution and mitigating the risk, right? How are we gonna do there? This is why we're a good investment. And then your, your ROI revenue and invitation to come and talk to you. So you, you boil it down into, you kind of squish it together, but you get much more into a, of a storytelling mode rather than a chart mode. The secret to your pitch to your success, remember, goal is not to get them to invest today, it's to get them to want to get your documents, want to have a set up a coffee, you know, something to get more information from you and start the due diligence process, that's your goal. The goal is to entertain and entice, particularly if you're doing pitch events, right? There's usually it could be anywhere from three companies to 10 companies. And I always call it, it's like a, it's like a beauty contest, mm -hmm. right? Because what is every investor, every entrepreneur that's up there saying? Invest in me, I'm gonna make you money, I'm the best thing since sliced white bread, right? <laughs> every one of them is saying that. In this other picture that I do, I have these pictures of peacocks on there because I think about, you know, peacocks are beautiful animals. So how does a female peacock pick the peacock? They're all beautiful, right? So how do you pick? So you've got to be, if you're creating that buzz, you've got to be the one that entertains them so they remember you, right? And not so much that they're gonna laugh and that kind of entertaining, but entertaining them where they get it, they understand, they're engaged in the process because you've done, you've led them down this, this process, right? And you're enticing them to want to get more information. You know, not just because, because if they, if you just are vague, you have no, no if you've left something completely out, well, particularly if it's a big event, they may or may not get to you because you have to understand an investor that's actively looking at deals, they're looking at a lot of deals. And they're narrowing it down to the ones, and they have this hidden checklist of things that they won't invest in. And so sometimes, because it is a beauty contest, they're narrowing it down to two deals that they're gonna ultimately pick because they like the entrepreneur, but they all have met a certain requirement. And if there's something where, you know, I don't know, I mean, it's kind of interesting, they, they didn't really talk about, you know, how they're going to actually make money or something. They didn't actually talk about how they're going to, you know, complete the, pro, you know, this thing or that thing or whatever it is, you know? If it's a, something that requires FDA, they didn't then talk about what's the timeline to get to FDA. They didn't talk about if there's any safety certifications they have to have on this this toy. You know, whatever it is, there's things that they didn't talk about their process. They may not know it. And you know what? I saw this deal yesterday, or I like that fifth company better. And so they go talk to the fifth company. They spend time with them. They end up seeing one of their friends, and they never get around to talking to you. Okay. So your whole goal is to entertain and entice, so they, you're the first one they go and talk to at an event like that, all right? So interesting and compelling, want to create the buzz, they want to spend time with you for due diligence, goes back to what Steve said, 90 seconds to decide whether I'm gonna pay attention for the next six minutes, and then that six minutes, whether I'm gonna spend 60 minutes with them, okay? I get to know easier than I get to a yes. And so, and it's all about them and the money. You must understand it is all about them and their money. Okay, so part of what your initial thing, I call it why an investor cares statement, a WIC statement, that I copyrighted when I teach, because this is what we used to go on our website, and so it is um, what you're, what's part of your initial thing that gets them into it. So why you are doing what you're doing and changing the marketplace. And then, so that becomes down to the risk versus reward, right? What is that return on investment? Because every startup or every private deal is very risky. And investors that invest in it understand that. And they, they use it as a, they diversify their portfolio to include it. And then they look at this versus re the reward, the potential reward. Are they willing to risk this amount of capital because the reward is this big, right? And further along, you, you, li you mitigate your risks with different things that you accomplish as you progress within your capital raise, as you progress within your understanding of your marketplace, and they start to believe that it becomes less risky. So then the risk versus reward becomes even a better return on investment for them. So the big thing is gold is in the follow through. The gold is in the follow through. I'm gonna say that one more time. The gold is in the follow through, right? If your goal is to get people to come and talk to you, what does that mean? That means that you have to follow up and follow through with them, okay? So, and I'm gonna give you, I used to go to this event up in New York. People would pay, pay 10 grand 
pitch at this event. And there'd be like 200 people in the audience, and 90% of them were all investors, other than the entrepreneurs that were pitching and a few lawyers and things like that. But they all either had access to money or were, were investors, okay? It was a very high cloud audience. And part of the process, because there would be 20 some companies pitching at this, they would do six minute pitches, it would be flights of four, they would go back to the tables, you could go talk to them, and then there was another six, right? Or whatever, it would just go, it would just rotate through, and then there was a big networking thing at the end. And so they would fill out a form, they would have a form, and you would fill out which companies you were interested in, because if you didn't get to the back of the table, because there's too many companies to talk to, and you only had, you know, five or 10 minutes in between to talk to them, you know, you'd fill it out. I can tell you, because I'd fill it out, because I'd run in my angel group, and I would let them come down and pitch to our group, and I wanted to get more information, because I didn't always get to it. And again, in a six minute pitch, you can't get all the information. It was amazing to me, these people paid all that amount of money, and I would have, say out of, let's just say 10 companies, maybe three call me, as somebody that was a potential investor or new investors, and when one, and I, one time, the one guy that I knew raised all their money, he called everybody on his list. Everybody that, got, that was on the list, he called them all and followed up with them, and followed up again. The gold is in the follow through. And the people that I know that have filled their funnel and converted them is because they did good follow through. So first thing you do when you're networking at the end, right, you should, you, at a big event, you might get a list, but also you're gonna be networking. If you've got other people on your team there, don't sit together. This goes into kind of like networking for investors, so it's a little tidbit on that, but you're gonna set in separate tables and you're not gonna stand next to each other until you're compiling, you're comparing notes. You want to be more in the room and finding you know, get your get them, and depending on how they, their expression of interest, if they want it, you're gonna grade them, A, B, or C on the back. It's just like a networking thing, right? Compare your list to get you get from the organizers. Who did they say that was interested? Did I talk to those same people? Because they won't know until after the event. And then you're going to compare who gave you cards. Because sometimes investors will become interested after they've talked to you. They didn't put anything on their form, so that's a good thing. That meant that they came up to you and talked to you, or just because you networked, you know, you had something, right? And then you're going to follow up by email, and you're gonna send, there's two types of emails that you're gonna send. First one is a personal one, right? It might include your profile, something not covered in the pitch, so individual, you know, kind of a personal type of thing. If you had any kind of follow-up, if you talked to them and you wrote notes on the back, so you know the questions that they had or things like that. And then the one is general. Everybody that expressed interest on that big list and something, because you get every time, almost without fail, after a presentation, you go, oh, I meant to cover this. Or something comes up in a conversation, and I remember it when companies would pitch and I talked to the investors, I said, well, what'd you think about that? They go, well, you know, I really would, there was one guy who was like, a, they would do it, it was the first of the solar safety going too fast signs. They were one of the first companies to come out with the solar powered, you know, drive slower signs. <laughs> and, um, and there was something in the way that it was designed or how long it would operate or something really basic that the guy, I knew the answer to it because I, and he hadn't covered it and I realized that he hadn't covered it. It was like really something pretty fundamental. So I told him, I said, you didn't cover this. You need to send out a general email to everybody I said, said, oh, by the way, this company came up later on in case someone else if you had this question and give them another piece of information, right? So that they, that it's something that re-engages them, moving them through the funnel, they go, oh, I didn't know that. And then you're going to, um, and then you're gonna, and you're gonna come back and you're gonna continue to stay in touch with them, but then you're gonna call them in order of priority. That's the ones that went, oh, he was really interested, A, B, but you're gonna call everybody that you had a conversation with because, again, the buzz. <clears throat> if any of y'all have ever been in a multi-level, you know one of the, the, the tricks of that business is who do you know? So you, those become words that you use with every conversation when an investor gets to a point where they go, nah, I'm not sure it's me. Well, who do you know that might be interested in something like this, okay? And you got to call them all. I gave you the example of these people spend all this money and they only call, they could, and I would call, talk to them and go, well, how come I never heard from I finally called one that was interested. He'd go, oh, well, I got to talk to these two investors and they were really, really interested. And I was like, yeah, but, you're gonna spend all, put all your eggs in one basket and spend all your time talking to those two guys and not, you know, you don't know the fifth person on the list was the one that was actually ready to write a check, right? So you just don't know. You gotta call them all, engage them based on the response 
that you get and they go up and down, have a spreadsheet, ABC, use your priority, right? You want to schedule a webinar and personal invite to do a follow-up mm -hmm. perhaps with them, go into it deeper, you did a six minute, would you like to see my longer presentation when I go into my marketing plan, when I go into it, well, I'm gonna have a webinar, I'm gonna do a Skype call, I'm gonna do something on this date, these are my two times, the old sales technique, which is better for you, two o'clock on a Thursday or eight o'clock on a Wednesday, right? You know, basic sales 101 when it comes to raising capital. So you schedule that and, and the main thing is you continue to call until they're told no, okay? Investors are big boys and girls. They know how to say no. Sometimes they don't, and so just like with a customer, if you were calling a customer, you would say, you would continue to call somebody that said they were interested and wanted their services, but they hadn't stroked the check yet or bought, you would continue to call them until they said no. You would find out, you may not leave a message every time, you may not, you know, but you would send them an email, you would, you know, stay in touch with them until their timing matched with your timing. Because if you don't do that, sometimes what happens is, and I've had companies that, I had a company that we were working with that raised a lot of money through our group, and um, there was three guys that they had had a follow-up with, and then they went MIA on him. And he was like, I don't know, I, you know, I don't really feel like I should call him anymore. And I said, well, let me see, find out. Well, one guy only made investments in January, and this was like October. But he didn't say that. He has made investments in January. The other guy, other two guys, had gone on month-long vacations. You know, we had one at a wedding and something that they went to and were doing, and they and they were just you know out of pocket because they're rich investors and they can do that. And so, you know, and so he if he hadn't because when when investors cycle back around and they're ready to stroke a check, they'll be looking at new deals. If you've stayed in touch with them and you've been giving them your progress answering their questions, even though it seems like it's a it's a trek it's yeah, pain to do some of that and do that follow up and stay in touch with them because it's it's time consuming. It's a relationship. It's the relationship you're building because of that A point I said, but they're not a no. You know, when they're tired of you calling them, when they're really a no and they made their decision to invest in something else, they're going to now that's as soon as you qualify them because I will confess that there are if you the, the, what we call, before there was a TV show called The Walking Dead, we called these investors Walking Deads, and they were they were ones that would walk around and act like they were investors, and they actually had no money. But they they used to be investors, and the money tied up. I mean, I, I've invested in lots of companies, and I've read that people go, oh, you, I go, I'm not investing right now, I'm waiting for an exit, and then I'll be investing again. I'll help you, I'll do whatever, but you know, I'm not actually doing any investing right now because I, I don't have any extra cash to do that kind of thing with. And so, you know, and, but I say it right up front. You know, I don't try to play games. But there are some people that will play games. So, but you can figure that out and you can ask the question. You know, what would it take for you to make a decision to invest in my, just like you do with a customer call. What, in, what do you need to know in order to make a decision to invest in my business? Well, you know, come to the key things they say, well, you know, go off and when, you know, when you get this product or this sales, come, come back to me. Well, that's a, a diffuser. Right? So you say, well, what does that mean? What is the very specific things that you need in order to make a, a, a buying decision, right? And then, and, and do you have the capital, or when do you think you're going to be making investments in the, in the in companies this year? You know, those kind of things. So entrepreneurs engage in the money hunt. This is my stuff. You can see all that stuff and where you can go to reach me. If you want to get these charts, you can go fill that out. Or send, if you already have my email, you can send me an email. I'll send them to you. And there's a few people left in the room. Any questions? I'm really behind schedule because so I gotta go, but you are awesome. And I yes. would I know that we already communicate, but I would really like to actually go over these with you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know that I have a lot of stuff going on, so it applies to me in so many levels. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, I missed most no of that. No problem. But excuse me. I'll see you later. Anybody got a question? Are we all done? That blew you away, so much information. Yeah. You, you, you touch on some really useful things in all in, in all sorts of areas, especially that last one, the keep at it till they say no. I I it is so hard for me. I don't want to bother people, you know? And so it's like and but you don't. You I keep trying to remind myself that people are busy, people I you know there are other but it, yeah, we don't we don't reach out enough. It's like, you know, if I haven't heard back, I it's like, okay, they're not interested, but that may not be the case. They just got busy. 
And investors also appreciate um, entrepreneurs that they show have tenacity, mm -hmm. right? Because that means that you're going to be tenacious about your business. And so they all, they res they respect that. You know, you're respectful in the way that you call, and you're not calling every day. You know, when would be a good time you talk to them? You say, and that's why you start to qualify them. When do you think you're going to be making an investment decision? And what do I need to do? Because I know you're busy, I'm busy. If I shouldn't be calling you because this is not a fit for you, Mr. Investor, or timing isn't right, I can make a note to call you at a different time. You know, I'll call you in 30 days. You know, I'll call you, when would be a good time to call you? I said, but what I don't want to do is if, this, if I believe I'm going to make a lot of money for my investors, and therefore I want to give you an opportunity to make money with me, you know, and so, you know, and I'm moving through these investors, I've got, I've got my own timeline, you've got a timeline, let's just see where we fit, you know? He said, well, you know, I just never have invested in this kind of company again. I, I understand that. So how many other investors, do, what kind of momentum do you need to see so that you know that, or who other investors do you need to talk to so you can get comfortable with my business model? You know, there's all kinds of things you can do. And part of it is um, believing enough that you've got an opportunity that is a great opportunity for them, not just because you say it, but because you've done your homework. You're not, you're not timid in talking to investors. Um, if you've done your homework and you really understand how you're going to succeed and your strategy to succeed, then you, you get grounded in that. Right. You know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's that, what is it, the word faith is, faith is uh, believing the things unseen? Is that right. how that goes? Well, you know, when you have faith, it's because you've been grounded in it that even though it's unseen, you believe it. We, you believe that it's going to be that because you've, you've researched enough, there's enough evidence that you believe it. Eventually you start, it, it's like it's already there in your head. It's already, you're already living that life. You're all, your company's already experiencing that thing because you've just played it over. So like, it's like an athlete you know, playing a perfect game in his head beforehand. Like you feel that right, but they also prepare. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that goes to that whole formula, the ABC, because you know there, there's all the things that an investor is expecting to see on a business, on an idea that's becoming a business, and then a business that's growing, right? Because there's still challenges. Also, it's there's so many companies out there that have raised half a million, million dollars, got into the market, and then they just stall because they didn't raise enough capital. They didn't know how they didn't have the right idea of how long it was going to take them to grow to be to point that they were sustainable, or they have other things that they want to do and they don't have the ability to grow it, and they don't know how to go from 10x to 100x. They don't have a plan for that, and then they didn't have enough money to hire the people that could tell them how to plan for that. So that's all part of the process, and, and most smart investors will want to know that you know that's part of the process to get to the point of being able to create an exit. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much for being in the room. And I stayed on. Did I stop it there? How do I stop it?